For more than 150 years, oil and gas has played a critical role in our society, improving human lives, raising standards of living, and enabling unprecedented economic growth. What do you do when your industry can no longer exist without creating catastrophes worldwide? The impacts of climate change are intensifying. It's important to understand the past. You can't understand where you are if you don't know how you got there. In a special three-part series, the epic story of our failure to tackle climate change. The whole world is heating up. And the role of the fossil fuel industry. Did big oil knowingly spread disinformation? Now, in the third and final part, big oil pivots to a new energy source. Renewables weren't quite there yet. Natural gas could provide continuous 24-hour generation. Doing something for the first time, taking advantage of this new resource, you don't always know what you don't know. And over time, what we learned is very, very very scary. And the challenges that have delayed climate action. We have a supply of natural gas that can last America nearly 100 years. The United States is now the number one producer of oil and natural gas. The global energy crisis exacerbated by Russia's war. It's released 60 million barrels of oil from reserves around the world. We all want a clean climate, but what we want more than that is to be able to fill up our cars below $4 a gallon. We're still very much in the fossil fuel age. We continue to maintain a position that has evolved with science and is today consistent with the science. We won't solve the climate crisis unless we solve the misinformation crisis. Hey guys, nice night, huh? There's this great irony of the Obama administration. He comes in promising to be the climate president. He's going to address these issues. And at the same time, we're in the middle of a recession. And one of the few rays of job growth is in oil and gas. Nowhere is the promise of innovation greater than in American-made energy the country down on its heels, and here comes the oil industry generating lots of oil, generating tax revenue. It was a great story for the oil industry to sell. Over the last three years, we've opened millions of new acres for oil and gas exploration. The potential for natural gas was huge. We have a supply of natural gas that can last America nearly 100 years. When Obama said we had 100 years of natural gas, we panicked because we knew the climate was changing so fast. We didn't take the alternative path of drastically increasing investment in renewables. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. It should have happened in the Obama years and we've exacerbated the climate change problem for 10 years when we could have been diminishing it. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. Well, we kind of had two masters at that point. We were trying to be a climate leader, but we were trying to be an energy superpower. It's impossible really to be both. Massive fracking booms happening in Texas, North yep. Dakota, Pennsylvania. Oh, I mean, just look at that. It's much of the middle of this it's country. It's led to unprecedented expansion in towns from Petula to Beeville oil and fields Clarence. fueling a red-hot energy boom in the U.S. During the early years of the Obama administration, despite widespread concern about climate change, the fossil fuel industry was experiencing an historic boom with tens of thousands of new wells across the United States. It was driven in large part by a new technology for extracting oil and natural gas. It would be a turning point for the fossil fuel industry and the fight against climate change. Tony and Graffia had helped make it happen. I certainly didn't grow up questioning fossil fuels it was just 1950s USA. Everything was automatic and wonderful. We didn't realize it at the time, but fossil fuels were driving 
what we call Western civilization. And still today, I value what fossil fuels have done for the world. In the early 1980s, Ingrafir was part of a team of U.S. government engineers tasked to solve a problem. U.S. oil and natural gas production had just fallen off, right off the end of the table uh, since the oil embargo. All out! Say it, all out of gas! What is this? I'm in the line two hours in, I can't get gas. This is baloney. America was becoming increasingly dependent on imported oil and gas from unreliable sources after its own reserves declined. There was a quest to unlock new domestic fossil fuels. Nobody had thought about spending a lot of money trying to get oil and gas out of shale. Nobody knew how to do it. And most people in the industry, the vast majority of the people in the industry, said it couldn't be done. In Grafia's team began devising new ways to extract large deposits of oil and gas trapped in shale rock formations across America. They called it fluid-driven fracture, now known as fracking. Even in this small piece of Marcella shale, there is stored methane which becomes natural gas when it's produced. And if one were to estimate the total amount of methane, thousands of square miles under all these states, it's many, many trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. Energy, how do you get energy out of the earth? It all comes by cracking rock. Oil embargo, energy crisis, crack rock, help. It would take decades before fracking technology was perfected. The process was complicated and expensive, and the urgency eventually abated. That changed when Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. The latest information from the National Hurricane Center puts Katrina on a path headed for New Orleans. We're expecting winds there up to 145 miles per hour with gusts up to 170. The storm was part of an emerging trend of extreme weather events. It devastated the Gulf Coast and damaged oil and gas production. Natural gas prices surged, making it more attractive to use new drilling and fracking technologies to get oil and gas from shale formations. You have this amazing irony of this huge a hurricane, uh, this climate event causing natural gas prices to go up. Do you have a figure or an estimate of how high we might see natural gas prices go? We've seen prices double over the last couple of years. And then with Hurricane Katrina, prices have doubled yet again. All of a sudden, these companies are saying, wow, you know, we're getting huge profits. The climate crisis was creating a huge market boom, which was being solved by people going out and drilling more natural gas, which was feeding into the climate crisis. It was a, a self-contained cycle. Wall Street took note. Over the next several years, investors would begin pumping billions of dollars into companies with fracking operations. Russell Gold covered the boom for the Wall Street Journal and worked with us on this film. Most people in the oil and gas industry, most reporters like myself that were covering it, thought that oil and gas in the United States was over. We had found all the good reserves, we had drilled all the big wells, but shale changed all that. It was unexpected, it was dramatic, and it was lubricated by billions and billions of dollars coming out of Wall Street. Thanks to record-breaking U.S. production, natural gas will continue to be a bargain. At Chesapeake Energy, we explore for American natural gas exclusively. No one would be more responsible for driving the fracking boom than Aubrey McClendon, CEO of Chesapeake Energy. Aubrey McClendon was a great visionary. He was a bigger-than-life individual. If there's one message I'd like to effectively communicate today, it's that America is at the beginning of a great natural gas boom. 
And this boom can largely He believed solve that natural gas was the fuel of the future, and that's, he called it that all the time. The technological breakthrough that we have developed in finding gas from shales changes everything about what you think about natural gas scarcity in America. With a growing awareness about fossil fuels' effect on the climate, McClendon believed that natural gas, which releases less CO2 than oil or coal when burned, could be marketed as part of the solution. He said, well, what do you think? You know, he said, do we need an association or an organization just focused on the gas opportunities out there? So we started the Clean Skies Foundation. It was just doing everything we possibly could to get out the message. What if America had its own clean energy, abundant and available for the next century or more, and possibly indefinitely? The fossil fuel industry tries to make this argument that we can be part of the solution. We can be a force for good on climate, that we'll go out and we'll drill the natural gas, which is going to help us lower um, our emissions. Doing a world of good for our economy, energy security, and our irreplaceable planet Earth. At the time, most of the country's power was generated by coal. McClendon saw an opportunity to position natural gas as a clean alternative. He starts courting probably the most prominent environmentalist in the country, Carl Pope, at the Sierra Club. We were working with Chesapeake to kill coal, and they were providing us with financial support. I think it was quite clear that Chesapeake's objective was to build markets for natural gas at the expense of coal. The concept that we were trying to convey was to say, eventually we have to be off all fossil fuels, but we have to get off coal first, oil second, and gas third. So we have the opportunity to replace a very dirty fossil fuel coal with a much cleaner fossil fuel natural gas for the next 20 or 30 years, and that's going to make it even cheaper to decarbonize our economy. Now, you're a major environmentalist. With the Sierra Club behind him, McClendon had laid out a powerful marketing strategy for natural gas, a strategy that would be embraced by ExxonMobil. X certainly marks the spot. ExxonMobil announcing it is buying XTO Energy, and it's a $41 billion deal, including some debt. ExxonMobil right is now. making a bet here on natural gas. In 2010, ExxonMobil purchased fracking company XTO for $41 billion. Overnight, it had become America's largest natural gas producer. But inside the company, some engineers were concerned about the sudden move into fracking. ExxonMobil felt that they had to get into the shale gas game in order for Wall Street to see them as a growth prospect. Darlong Chang had joined ExxonMobil after getting his PhD in mechanical engineering. He worked on conventional natural gas projects abroad before becoming part of the company's fracking push in the US. My peers, when they were recruiting me, they told me that ExxonMobil was going to be part of the energy transition over my career. They talked about the excitement of having gas be a bridge fuel to the future of energy. I think one of the biggest challenges that the world is facing today is to develop all the energy we need in an environmentally friendly way. The fact that natural gas was much cleaner burning than coal, that it produced half the carbon dioxide emissions of coal, those are very appealing to me. But Chang knew that the methane in natural gas had the potential to do significant damage if allowed to leak into the atmosphere. Natural gas is primarily methane, and methane, when it's leaked out into the atmosphere, can have orders of magnitude more global warming impact than carbon dioxide. Chang worried that the thousands of new, lightly regulated fracking operations in the U.S. could be leaking massive amounts of methane and turbocharge the climate crisis. Shale gas was like the Wild West. There was already a perception that these smaller operators were not acting responsibly with these shale gas wells. 
Ari felt that having many methane gas wells was a ticking time bomb for methane gas leaks. The more engineering infrastructure, the more wells and the more pipes, the more potential there is for leakage. When they were marketing natural gas as clean energy, they didn't really know what they were talking about because they were fixated on the idea that natural gas, when burned, produces half the carbon dioxide emissions of coal. But without measurement devices to verify that you're not significantly leaking, you can't be sure that your natural gas is actually giving you less of a global warming impact than coal. The industry was not monitoring methane leakage, so they did not have data about how much was leaking. And there wasn't much appetite for management to measure methane leakage because if they found out there was a problem, they would have to do something about it. At the time, ExxonMobil and others in the industry said they were working to reduce methane emissions, which were already within limits set by the EPA. But on the ground, some in the environmental community were witnessing widespread leaks. I am hunting for methane that is escaping from oil and gas facilities because that's what I do. I'm a methane hunter. Sharon Wilson worked at an environmental watchdog group in Texas, documenting methane emissions. All of these pieces of equipment have got leaks. There's a lot of methane going off the flare. This is just a really, really dirty site. This is an optical gas imaging camera, and it makes the invisible methane and volatile organic compounds from oil and gas facilities, it makes those visible. These emissions, what's coming out of oil and gas, sites, the fact that it's invisible has helped them be able to expand and help them uh, maintain that narrative of being clean. And when that is not the case. The tanks are venting. Wilson traveled the country, gathering evidence of methane leaks at fracking sites, including ExxonMobil wells. We need to move about where that telephone pole is. She'd send her findings to regulators and the press. It's just disbelief that you can show someone video after video, proof after proof after proof, and they still do nothing. I sure can't compete with the oil and gas industry PR budget that they use to pump propaganda at us. That tank is emitting a lot of methane. I'm showing their dirty secrets that can't be seen without this optical gas imaging camera. ExxonMobil would not grant us any interviews. In a statement, it said it has been an industry leader in the effort to reduce methane emissions and has been advancing technology to detect leaks. As Sharon Wilson was sounding the alarm, a growing number of scientists were waking up to the dangers of methane, including the man who'd helped pioneer the process of fracking. I became very much more concerned about climate change when I realized what shale gas and oil was going to unleash. That's the great word, unleash. This is trait. Unleash a tsunami of oil and gas. Yes, <laughs> that's what it did. That's when I started feeling contradictory regret and pride. <laughs> pride that we had done good engineering work to help somebody eventually figure out how to do it. Regret that we had figured we had helped somebody figure out how to do it. <laughs> 
by going to shale, we're going to prolong the fossil fuel industry. And by prolonging the fossil fuel industry, we're going to exacerbate climate change. By now, Tony Ingraffio was a civil engineering professor at Cornell University and had spent years advising oil and gas companies. In 2011, he and colleagues published a critical report on the climate impact of fracking. What Bob Howarth and I locked onto was this very crucial point, which is it's not just CO2 that's driving climate change. It's also methane. The paper said, the climate impact of shale gas is such that it's worse than coal, worse than oil. And the reaction to the paper was disturbing. I had never been a co-author of a paper that created a political firestorm. The criticism came from many sides, including the National Academy of Sciences and the leading industry group, America's Natural Gas Alliance. They claimed the report had overestimated the level of methane leaks and overstated methane's impact as a greenhouse gas. At first we were pilloried, then we were ignored. We had to endure a lot of personal attacks for no good reason. I can understand people saying to me, you're a traitor. You took their money for 25 years. You did their research, and now you're saying stop. Yeah, okay, I am. Criticism of the Cornell report also came from another academic institution. MIT's influential Energy Initiative, which had just published its own report promoting natural gas as a bridge to get away from burning coal and a way to reduce CO2 emissions. Methane emissions are a very important greenhouse gas that needs to be addressed. It's just that methane emissions from the oil and gas industry are actually a minority of methane emissions. There's some very, very tough problems. Uh, agriculture, dairy farms, enormous methane emitters. Uh, fortunately, in contrast to carbon dioxide, uh, methane has a relatively short uh, lifetime in the atmosphere. Uh, that doesn't mean one should ignore it. It means that one better eliminate new emissions. Ernest Moniz led MIT's Future of Natural Gas study, which said the Cornell work was based on unsubstantiated estimates. Moniz would not talk about it in our interview, nor would he answer questions about the funding for the study, other than to say it was transparent. It, the point is, we always believe in transparency, and, and so that's, yeah. The MIT report's major sponsor was Aubrey McClendon's American Clean Skies Foundation. We really wanted MIT in particular because they had been the authoritative source testifying before Congress on all these other energy. And we thought we want the gold standard. And we said, we believe this is the next big thing. Denise Bode was on the advisory committee for the MIT study. We made our case that it was a valid emerging issue that they could add credibility to. And then, um, and, and then they accepted it. Bolstered by the MIT study, the industry narrative on natural gas would take hold in Washington. I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. It became part of President Obama's 2012 State of the Union address where he unveiled his ambitious new energy policy. This country needs an all-out, all-of-the-above strategy that develops every available source of American energy. He would push for investments in renewable energy, but he also doubled down on oil and natural gas. We have a supply of natural gas, 
that can last America nearly 100 years. And my administration will take every possible action to safely develop this energy. Natural gas, from an economic perspective, the costs that were passed on consumers in terms of lower energy bills was a net plus. And then we saw that fitting squarely in, in, in the climate agenda. Renewables weren't quite there yet. The nuclear projects were just proving to be too expensive. And natural gas could provide continuous 24-hour generation. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. We became an oil and gas country. It affected our politics. It affected our economy. And it begins to really affect kind of how we look at the world. The United States looks at the world. The U.S. had become the largest producer of natural gas in the world, helping spark a decline in CO2 emissions, even as studies were piling up showing a dangerous rise in methane emissions. Doing something for the first time, taking advantage of this new resource, you don't always know what you don't know. And over time, what we learned about methane emissions as it relates to natural gas is very, very scary. Heather Zeichel would go on to advise the natural gas industry, then lobby for renewables. I think the Obama administration tried to be very conscious of everything, all the implications of the shale revolution. Um, but at the time, I, I think early Obama administration years, we didn't have access to the kinds of information that we would have liked to and needed to have had to take the proper regulatory steps to ensure as safe and climate friendly production as possible. At MIT, Ernest Moniz says they've also learned a lot since their early research. Were you aware how large the methane leaks could be or would be when producing natural gas? No, I, th I think it's come much more into focus uh, uh, recently. Uh, we were concerned about uh, about leaks, but I think the the quantitative scale uh, of the issue has become more clear in recent years with uh, better measurement devices, including atmospheric measurements, which are now uh, becoming uh, much more commonplace. Moniz would become energy secretary in Barack Obama's second term, where he helped advocate for the natural gas boom. But by then, natural gas had lost its support from the Sierra Club and Carl Pope, who had allowed the group to take millions of dollars from Chesapeake Energy. The natural gas industry, excuse me, the gas industry, but you know, they've, got, they've trained me to call it the natural gas industry, nothing natural about it. I didn't understand how strong they were. I thought the big player was oil. I thought gas was kind of a junior cousin. Gas turns out to have an awful lot of political strength. And Americans had been more fully sold on the myth that gas was green. Firefighters are worried that a deadly Southern California wildfire could continue to spread this afternoon. Nine major wildfires that are burning right now across the state of California. 2012 is shaping up to be one of the worst fire seasons on record. For more on this and other Frontline programs, visit our website at pbs.org frontline. Order Frontlines The Power of Big Oil on DVD. Visit Shop PBS or call 1 800 Play PBS. Frontline is also available on Amazon Prime Video. Data versus doubt, progress versus politics. It's the last episode of the series here on BBC Two. It's Big Oil versus the world.
what do you do when you learn the product you make threatens the entire planet? ExxonMobil provides an essential component of modern society, affordable, reliable, and abundant energy. They were actually making eerily accurate predictions about how high the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would be. There are massive fracking booms happening in Texas, North Dakota, Pennsylvania. ExxonMobil is making a bet here on natural gas. America is at the beginning of a great natural gas boom. Did it turn out we had it wrong? Absolutely. What we learned about methane emissions is very, very scary. Methane is harming every single person and every animal and everything on this planet. Global warming, and a lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, OK? They knew that eventually policymakers were going to catch up and take actions that would put their business in jeopardy. So what do you do? Delay, distract, and deflect. I certainly didn't go up questioning fossil fuels or thinking about where energy came from. It was just 1950s USA. Everything was automatic and wonderful. Soon, traffic will flow smoothly in, around, and between every major city and town in America. Fossil fuels were driving what we call Western civilization, and still today. I value what fossil fuels have done for the world. This is the road to prosperity. I was proud to be working years later in the oil and gas industry. But we each have to make our own decisions, decide what to do with our lives. And when you change course, you change course. Four decades ago, a young engineer called Tony Ingrafia joined a government task force searching for ways to access new sources of oil and gas. It was being driven partly by this patriotic fervor. We don't want to be beholden to the Middle East. Right? US oil production and natural gas production had just fallen off, right off the end of the table. We're going to work really hard to make sure that the U.S. always has its own supply of fossil fuels. What's not to like? Their search led them to shale rock. Even in this small piece of Marcella shale, there is stored methane which becomes natural gas when it's produced. Uh, and if one were to estimate the total amount of methane, thousands of square miles under all these states, it's many, many trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. But nobody had thought about spending a lot of money trying to get oil and gas out of shale. And most people in the industry, the vast majority of the people in the industry said it couldn't be done. We did a lot of computer modeling and concluded that it was certainly possible. After years of further research, the industry perfected a method of fracturing rock and horizontal drilling, fracking. People realized then that there was this enormous untapped resource. We've unlocked the keys to the kingdom. Once fracking became cost-effective, Wall Street took note. 
Most people in the oil and gas industry, most reporters like myself that were covering it, thought that oil and gas in the United States was over. We had found all the good reserves, we had drilled all the big wells, and shale changed all that. It was unexpected, it was dramatic, and it was lubricated by billions and billions of dollars coming out of Wall Street. Thanks to record-breaking U.S. production, natural gas will continue to be a bargain. At Chesapeake Energy, we explore for American natural gas. The leader of the fracking boom was Chesapeake Energy's Aubrey McClendon. Aubrey McClendon was a great visionary. He was one of the best natural speakers I'd ever seen. CEO of Chesapeake Energy, we welcome you, Mr. McClendon. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there's one message I'd like to effectively communicate today, it's that America is at the beginning of a great natural gas boom. And this boom can largely- He believed that natural gas was the fuel of the future. And that's, he called it that all the time. For clean electricity, natural gas is the answer. Just remember, pollution is no bargain. Natural gas is. At the time, most of the world's power was generated by coal, which was sending greenhouse gas emissions to record levels. McClendon argued that gas was better for the planet because it released less CO2. He said, well, what do you think? You know, he said, do we need an association or an organization just focused on the gas opportunities out there? So we started the Clean Skies Foundation. It was just doing everything we possibly could to get out the message. What if America had its own clean energy, abundant and available for the next century or more, and possibly indefinitely? The fossil fuel industry tries to make this argument that we can be part of the solution. We can be a force for good on climate, that we'll go out and we'll drill the natural gas, which is going to help us lower um, our emissions. Doing a world of good for our economy, energy security, and our irreplaceable planet Earth. And then all of a sudden, Aubrey McClendon, he starts courting probably the most prominent environmentalist in the country, Carl Pope, at the Sierra Club. And we have Carl Pope, uh, the executive director of the Sierra Club, who is a giant in the environmental movement. Aubrey McClendon's Chesapeake Energy secretly donated $26 million to the Sierra Club, America's most influential environmental organization. Well, we were working with Chesapeake to kill coal, and they were providing us with financial support. The concept that we were trying to convey was to say, eventually we have to be off all fossil fuels, but we have to get off coal first, oil second, and gas third. So we have the opportunity to replace a very dirty fossil fuel coal with a much cleaner fossil fuel natural gas for the next 20 or 30 years. The gas industry had gained a powerful friend in the environmental movement. It was an alliance Carl Pope would later come to regret. The natural gas industry, excuse me, the gas industry, but you know, they've got, they've trained me to call it the natural gas industry, nothing natural about it. I didn't understand how strong they were. I thought the big player was oil. I thought gas was kind of a junior cousin. Gas turns out to have an awful lot of political strength. And Americans had been more fully sold on the myth that gas was green. And I didn't realize how deeply that it sunk into people's brains. It wasn't probably mine. Several other major environmental organizations went on to back natural gas expansion. Aubrey McClendon would die in a car accident in 2016. But by then, his campaign to sell gas as a climate solution had changed the world. It's sort of amazing that there was this guy in Oklahoma City who helped really shift the whole national dialogue about climate and about fossil fuels. And just at a time when a lot of scientists were sort of looking at this and saying, we really need to start weaning off 
fossil fuels. And in doing so, he, he locks in the United States onto natural gas for the next generation. There are massive fracking booms happening in Texas, North yep. Dakota, Pennsylvania. It's much of the middle of this country. It's led to unprecedented expansion in towns from Petula to Beeville. The oil fields fueling a red hot energy boom. Tens of thousands of fracked wells were now appearing across America and the world. The boom attracted the interest of one of the world's largest oil companies. X certainly marks the spot. ExxonMobil announcing it is buying XTO Energy, and it's a $41 billion deal, including some... ExxonMobil is making a bet here on natural gas. Overnight, ExxonMobil became America's largest gas producer. Da Long Chang was an ExxonMobil engineer who worked on the company's fracking operations. My peers, when they were recruiting me, they knew my concerns about climate change. They told me that ExxonMobil was the largest non-state energy company in the world. And even though oil and gas had been its bread and butter, uh, ExxonMobil was going to be part of the energy transition over my career. And uh, I believed them. They talked about the excitement of having gas be a bridge fuel to the future of energy. I think one of the biggest challenges that the world is facing today is to develop all the energy we need in an environmentally friendly way. The fact that natural gas was much cleaner burning than coal, that it produced half the carbon dioxide emissions of coal, those are very appealing to me. But Chang also knew there was a major problem with gas if it's allowed to leak. Natural gas is primarily methane. And methane, when it's leaked out into the atmosphere, can have orders of magnitude more global warming impact than carbon dioxide. Methane gas can have an impact of more than 80 times the impact of carbon dioxide. But the reason why this is so important is because we only have a couple of decades to avert runaway climate change. Chang worried that the tens of thousands of new fracking operations across the globe could be leaking massive amounts of methane, turbocharging the climate crisis. It's commonly known among engineers that all gases leak and that if you don't take measures to check for leaks and if you don't take measures to prevent those leaks, then the assumption is that you're guilty until proven innocent. Ari felt that having many unconventional methane gas wells was a ticking time bomb for methane gas leaks. The more engineering infrastructure, the more wells and the more pipes, the more potential there is for leakage. When they were marketing natural gas as clean energy, they were fixated on the idea that natural gas, when burned, produces half the carbon dioxide emissions of coal. But without measurement devices to verify that you're not significantly leaking, you can't be sure that your natural gas is actually giving you less of a global warming impact than coal. There wasn't much appetite for management to measure methane leakage because if they found out there was a problem, they would have to do something about it. At the time, ExxonMobil and others in the industry said they were working to reduce methane emissions. But on the ground, some in the environmental community were documenting widespread leaks. I am hunting for methane that is escaping from oil and gas facilities because that's what I do. I'm a methane hunter. Sharon Wilson worked at an environmental watchdog group investigating methane emissions. This is an optical gas imaging camera, and it makes the invisible methane and volatile organic compounds from oil and gas facilities, it makes those visible. All of these pieces of equipment have got leaks 
there's a lot of methane going off the flare. This is just a really, really dirty site. These emissions, what's coming out of oil and gas sites, the fact that it's invisible has helped them be able to expand and help them uh, maintain that narrative of being clean. And when that is not the case. The tanks are venting. It started with local concerns, but then when I realized what a powerful actor methane is, I realized that it's a global problem. We need to move about where that telephone pole is. It was hard to imagine at first how much gas is releasing from these sites, from everywhere, and how many ways that they release gas, all the way from the drilling all the way until it ends up at a power plant. She kept sending her findings to regulators and the press. It's just disbelief that you can show someone video after video, proof after proof after proof, and they still do nothing. I sure can't compete with the oil and gas industry PR budget that they use to pump propaganda at us. Wilson gathered evidence from hundreds of sites, including some operated by ExxonMobil. In a statement, ExxonMobil said it's been an industry leader in the effort to reduce methane emissions and has been using advanced technology to detect leaks. What is happening in the United States, particularly in Texas, it's affecting people all around the globe because methane is harming every single person and every animal and everything on this planet. As Sharon Wilson was sounding the alarm, a growing number of engineers and scientists were waking up to the dangers of methane leaks, including the man who'd helped pioneer the process of fracking. I became very much more concerned about climate change when I realized what shale gas and oil was going to unleash. That's the right word, unleash. <laughs> this is true, unleash the tsunami of oil and gas. Yes, <laughs> that's what it did. That's when I started feeling contradictory regret and pride. <laughs> pride that we had done good engineering work to help somebody eventually figure out how to do it. Regret that we had helped somebody figure out how to do it. <laughs> By now, Tony Ingraffia was a civil engineering professor at Cornell University and had spent years advising oil and gas companies. In 2011, he and colleagues published a critical report on the climate impact of fracking. We spent two years doing the research, published a paper in a prestigious journal, and what Bob Howarth and I locked onto was this very crucial point, which is it's not just CO2 that's driving climate change. It's also methane. We're the first people to really try to cumulatively look at these methane emissions from shale gas. It happens in all these various steps. This is what we think the methane emissions look like. If the leakage rate of the natural gas is of the neighborhood of 3%, then it's, it's bad for the climate, it's burning coal. What we were suggesting is that from the time you really start drilling all the way through to final consumer, some percentage, three and a half, four, 5% of the gas that's produced is emitted unburned to the atmosphere. The report was the first to contradict the narrative that natural gas from fracking was a climate solution. The reaction to the paper was disturbing. 
I had never been a co-author of a paper that created a political firestorm and a scientific firestorm. At first we were pilloried, then we were ignored. I can understand people saying to me, you're a traitor. You took their money for 25 years. You did their research and now you're saying stop. Yeah, okay, I am. We had to endure a lot of personal attacks for no good reason. It hurts. Some of those people were good friends and won't talk to me anymore. My colleague Bob Howarth lost research funding. The pushback from industry and from academics who may or may not have some tie to the industry, though in many cases they, they, they did, uh, was, was strong. The, the basic discussion was methane emissions couldn't possibly be as high as, as we said. Well, this is a screenshot of an ad from uh, Google that we took after our paper came out in 2011, uh, the American Natural Gas Alliance, ANGA, paid for a Google ad that was up there for 22 months before they pulled it down. They discover in the eyes of the American Natural Gas Alliance that I'm a fraud. The fossil fuel industry has a <laughs> history of doing what they need to to protect their interests. And, uh, you know, they can be ruthless. That's, that's a, a fact. The Cornell professors were criticized by other universities, including the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. That year, the influential MIT Energy Initiative published a study on the future of natural gas, mainly funded by Aubrey McClendon's Clean Skies Foundation. The future natural gas study at MIT, I think we were ahead of the curve in uh, talking about the forthcoming uh, shale gas uh, revolution. Uh, methane emissions uh, are, are a, a very important greenhouse gas that needs to be addressed. It's just that methane emissions from the oil and gas industry are actually a minority of methane emissions. Uh, fortunately, in contrast to carbon dioxide, uh, methane has a relatively short uh, lifetime in the atmosphere uh, that doesn't mean one should ignore it. It means that one better eliminate new emissions. The study promoted gas as a bridge fuel to a lower carbon future. It also criticized the Cornell Methane Report as unsubstantiated. Ernest Moniz insists industry funding did not influence these conclusions. The point is, we always believe in transparency, and, and so that's, yeah. The funding was part of a wider strategy by the fossil fuel industry. By 2012, oil and gas companies were pumping hundreds of millions of dollars into departments at prestigious academic institutions across America. The very research centers that we assume to be independent are being funded by the very industry that they're supposed to be critically investigating. This high-profile MIT report trumpets the alleged benefits of methane gas and fracking while downplaying their downsides. It has laid the intellectual groundwork for the reliant on methane gas as a bridge fuel. The problem is, these are, to a letter, the talking points of the fossil fuel industry. Can we talk about generally who funded the MIT Energy Initiative? Not necessarily that report. No, let, let's. No, let, let's 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 just end uh, the interview, okay? I mean, if you want to paint that as some kind of black spot, well, go ahead. Ridiculous, totally ridiculous. Look at the output, not the input. It's very disappointing, to be perfectly honest. Like... Moniz would become energy secretary in Barack Obama's second term, where he helped advocate for the natural gas boom. 
bolstered by the MIT study, the industry narrative on natural gas took hold in Washington. It became part of President Obama's 2012 State of the Union address, where he unveiled his new energy policy. There's this great irony of the Obama administration. He comes in promising to be the climate president. He's going to address these issues. He really positions himself as, I'm going after oil and gas. We're really going to rein them in. The president of the United States. But by 2012, he's standing up there at a State of the Union talking about how great natural gas is. We have a supply of natural gas that can last America nearly 100 years. And my administration will take every possible action to safely develop this energy. When Obama said we had 100 years of natural gas, we panicked because we knew the climate was changing so fast. Instead of helping the public awareness of the harm and what was happening, they just glossed over all of that and everyone became super excited about this cheap, clean energy that was going to last 100 years. It, it's maddening. Because America will develop this resource without putting the health and safety of our citizens at risk. We didn't take the alternative path of drastically increasing investment in renewables. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. It should have happened in the Obama years. And we've exacerbated the climate change problem for 10 years when we could have been diminishing it. Doing something for the first time, taking advantage of this new resource, you don't always know what you don't know. And over time, what we learned about methane emissions as it relates to natural gas is very, very scary. I think the Obama administration tried to be very conscious of all the implications of the shale revolution. Did it turn out we had it wrong? Abs absolutely. But at the time, we didn't know that it was wrong. And it's, it's not like we didn't have some of the best scientific minds in the country working on that. I'm terrified that we're not going to do nearly enough fast enough. The age of fossil fuels is far from over. We've unleashed the whirlwind. It's not too late, but we lost the decades. And now we're playing catch up. What climate change means to me is looking in the eyes of my grandchildren and wondering what kind of hell they're going to pay. foot inside the door, and you'll never look back. The rise and rise of the Norwegian oil industry. Why would you turn down a well-paid job? OK, let's do it. B-14's blowing out. This is the most oil-producing whale in the world. <laughs> it's too late. We've lost control. Be careful. The weather, is it very unusual? Mayday, mayday. Norwegian drama, State of Happiness. Coming soon to BBC4 and iPlayer. Make 
Aiden? Why don't you tell me everything? We had a good life. It was good, and then... Because of her, it's become this. A deranged woman kidnapped my baby and nearly killed him. Agatha Fyfall is committed and very cunning. She'll never stop. What kind of story are you going to tell about Agatha? Well, it'll change everything. The Secret She Keeps starts Saturday at 9.15 on BBC.